Enshrouded is a brilliant survival RPG that has so many amazing layers to it. Between the crafting, the exploration, and the secret mechanics, Enshrouded is massive, and it's easy to miss out on some of its most important nuances. So the goal of this video is to be the most complete Enshrouded beginner guide on the internet. Let's dive straight in. All right, the first decision that you're gonna have to make is which server are you gonna play on? Are you gonna create your own that's private? Are you gonna host one? Or are you going to join an online game? If you do private, it just basically treats the game like a single player game. And later on if you ever want to join your friends your character will join their server so if your friend creates a server or if you choose to host a server right it's going to be the same character anyway so there's very little harm in choosing private to start if you're not sure what you want to do or hosting a game that nobody else joins if you want to play by yourself just make sure you put a password on it but no matter what you're going to be playing the same character on all of them and so you can log in on tuesday on your private server and play your character and then on wednesday you can join your friend's server and progress your character a little more and then you can host a server server on Thursday, right? And it's always going to be your same character with the same levels and all the same stuff that's been done. So there's a nice bit of continuity in that way. So once you choose your server type, then you're going to create a new one. We're going to just join the one that I've already made here so I can show you how to play the game. The first thing the game's going to have you do is build a flame altar. So you'll come into your crafting menu right here and you'll build a flame altar. In order to craft that, all you need is five stone. To get stone, all you're going to do is pick it up off the ground when you see it. Right. And you're going to do that. And then you'll be able to craft your flame altar. And then you just drag that flame altar onto your bar somewhere. And then boom, you'll put it down. And now you've got a flame altar down on the ground. And basically the way that acts is the red outline that was on the ground while I was placing it is going to be the area that you can build within. Once you've created an altar, it tells you the building area. It's 40 by 40 by 40. This altar is really important. Not only is it going to allow you to build around it, but it's also going to be a teleport point so that you can fast travel to it. And it's also going to be something that you can upgrade to make your character more able to explore the world. So the first upgrade is going to allow you to extend its range. So instead of 40 by 40 by 40, it would be 80 by 80 by 80, right? and it becomes a much bigger area for you to build in. The 40 by 40 is plenty and everything beyond that is just for funsies, right? So you want to you want to make something extra deluxe above and beyond what is required of you. You can keep upgrading the altar to make the area you can build in bigger, but it's by no means necessary. The second one, however, is absolutely necessary. So while you're playing the game, you'll be able to come here and click on it and it'll tell you what you need for the next upgrade. Right now, my altar would be going from six to seven. You'll be going from one to two at first and the upgrade materials required are going to be significantly less. It's just a few things that you're going to be collecting while you're running around the game. Now, this is a survival game. So one of the most important pieces of advice I can impart on you is collect everything. If you see a new material that you've never seen before, pick it up. Keep collecting it until you have a full stack of that stuff back at your house, because guess what? You will 100% need it. It doesn't matter what it is. It's going to be used in some recipe, some building material, something somewhere is going to require that material material that you stumbled upon for the first time. So always pick it up. And then in your base, you're going to build a ton of storage coffers. These things are relatively cheap, so don't feel bad about building a bunch of them. Now, one thing I will say is, you know, you can build some of these little ones here. So if we go to our craft bench right here, this is the first thing that you're going to get really in the game to craft with is you're going to get this craft bench and you'll come down here to storage. So under survival, you've got storage. It's kind of an awkward place for it. It, I think a lot of people spend a bit of time finding the storage in there, but that's where it is. Come to the bench, scroll down to storage. There it is. And you can make these tiny chests real easily. Just some twigs and some string twigs. You just collect bushes outside and then string. You'll collect fibers from the same bushes and you will combine it into string. And we'll talk about how to do that in a second here. But since we're talking about chests, I just want to say you can make a couple of these little ones, but then I would immediately switch over to the small ones as soon as you start getting metal scraps and you're able to make nails because the great thing about the small ones is they can be upgraded later to these magic chests. See how they're glowing blue? And what that means is when I'm crafting at a bench here, it's drawing from the materials in these blue ones, these magic chests. Now this one right here, if there's crafting materials in there, I have to pull it out in order to craft. So I don't keep any crafting materials in there because that would be a pain. And it is a pain until you unlock these magic chests. And I'll talk about how to do that in a moment. But just know that making these small chests is a great investment because when you get this guy here and you click storage, you 
you see here, one of the cool things this game does is it uses the previous version of something in the recipe for the enhanced version of it. So it requires a medium chest, a shroud core and goo, right? And that medium chest is what I was already using from the very beginning of the game to store my items. So very little is wasted. Now these little tiny ones here, these are kind of going to be wasted. I'd like to replace those and just trash them sometime soon. But here's one that's not upgraded yet. So I could empty this thing and then come over to the craft bench and then just turn it into a magic one. And that way, when I'm crafting, all my ingredients will be pulled from it. This is just really important. So I thought I'd mention that early on here. If you're enjoying this massive guide, be sure to give it a like so the algorithm knows. Now, since we're talking about crafting and because crafting is such a massive part of this game, it is a survival game and you can choose to make crafting a really big part of this game or you can choose to make it a pretty big part of this game, but it's always going to be part of the game. So let's talk about the different types of crafting. The first one that you're going to get is the one one that we started with. You've got this crafting menu right here. It's V on your keyboard, right? You just press that and you'll be in your crafting menu. And from here, there's a lot of things that you can craft without having a workbench. This is stuff you can craft anywhere in the game, anytime. So you're out on the fly, deep inside of a cave or way up high on a mountain or, you know, in the middle of combat with some enemies and you're out of arrows. You can open up your crafting menu here and you can say, hey, I need I need some wooden arrows, right? And so you run around, grab some twigs wigs off the ground and then fashion yourself some wooden arrows. These are the worst type of arrows that you can craft, but they're far better than nothing when you're in a pinch. Because if you do decide to use a bow, you will absolutely run out of arrows from time to time. So these will come in really handy. Same thing with lockpicks. Lockpicks are one of those things that you're just always going to need. You're always going to want to have on hand when you're running around the game. And this is something you can craft as soon as you start finding metal scrap. Metal scraps are real easy to find. There's mobs that drop them when you're killing them. You'll notice real quickly which ones they are. More than that, you can break containers out in the game. And when you break those containers, they will drop metal scraps. So anytime you're out and you're desperate, for a material, start breaking containers. If you need wood, you'll probably get some wood. If you need metal scraps, you'll eventually get some metal scraps, right? Those containers out there, those boxes, great for providing both of those materials. Now, the workbench right here is the thing we were just talking about before. This is your first step into crafting. That's the thing that's going to let you make you know, the next tier of materials. These are things you can only make inside of your house. It's a lot of crafting materials for building your house, storage, and then most importantly, your glider and your grappling hook. Now, your glider is something you can craft right away way. So right in the very beginning of the game, you'll be able to step outside, you'll kill a few little animals and you'll get some animal furs. Easy peasy. You'll get some string by picking up some plants, turning those fibers into string. You'll get some shroud spores by killing some of the baddies right outside the exit inside of the shroud. And then shroud wood is easy. You just step into the shroud and you chop down a tree or two. I think it's going to take you about two trees. You chop them down and you get your eight pieces of shroud wood and then you come on back. Now, in order to do all that, you're going to need to craft yourself an axe and a pickaxe. These are two things you're going to want right away. And then as you play the game more and you get farther into your crafting trees, you'll be able to create better versions of the axe and the pickaxe that can, you know, do the same job, but do it faster and better. And remember, you can find those in your basic crafting menu, the one that you can open anywhere, anytime in the game. The grappling hook is also really easy to get. You just go grab some metal scraps. I tell you a great spot to grab that later in the video. You grab some string. That's just grabbing some bushes and then turning their fiber into string and then you get the shroud spores which is just killing enemies inside of the shroud the one important thing to know about the grappling hook you actually have to interact with grappling hook locations placed into the game so you're not going to get to become spider-man in this game now let's quickly take a look at everything that's on the screen right now because this is the same stuff you're going to be looking at from the very beginning of the game to the very end of the game so at the bottom there we've got eight slots and then our q which is going to be our ranged weapons so the way this game works is you've got this menu right here which is going to be N if you're on PC and you can put your gear on and it's going to go into these slots nicely here. Plus, you're going to have a slot specifically for ranged weapons. So you put your bow here, for example, and then when you hold Q, it automatically pulls out your bow. You don't have to switch over to that weapon like you would for, say, if I want to use my sword or if I'm going to use my wand, right? I'm going to pew pew with the wand. So you've got these eight slots. And then if you hit alt, you can switch to the back bar here or the second bar, which has another eight slots for you to choose from. I think a good strategy is to put your weapons basically like I'm in combat mode, put 
put all the stuff you need while in combat on one bar and then put everything else on the other bar things that you don't need while in combat you know maybe your your pickaxe or your logging axe those two things you know you wouldn't be using those in combat because they do horrible damage you're really in dire straits if you're using those as your damage so you would have food back here because you want to buff up before you go into battle not while you're in battle and that sort of thing so the front bar is where we have all of our weapons and this is a good time to talk about everything that's on that bar because you can kind of see the four different types of weapons that exist in this game and there's a really important distinction to be made between each one because it's not terribly intuitive once you understand it it's great but until then it's really confusing so let's talk about them so first you've got your melee weapons which this is the most intuitive one it works exactly the way you would expect it to and then you've got a shield which is fantastic this thing is snappy as long as you hit your block button before the enemy hits you it counts as a block man it is really snappy so definitely take advantage of how quick the shield is in this game it's frankly it's crazy op because it absorbs 100 of most damage then the next weapon we have on my bar is a wand now wands are really cool because one they auto aim on your target so if there's an enemy you can by the way you can press tab to lock on enemies and then you can just fire your wand and it's going to lock onto him and every shot is going to hit that enemy you don't have to aim this like you would normally have to aim a ranged weapon the other great thing about wands is it has unlimited ammo well sort of every weapon has a durability underneath it you can see there under the sword it's full and you can see the wand every time i use it the durability is going down ever so slightly that basically acts as its limiter on how much i can use it whereas the bow is a ranged weapon but in order to use it it requires me to have arrows on hand now for that reason the bow is going to do quite a bit more damage than the wand but the wand is great Great to have on your bar somewhere just in case you need range damage because there are going to be things that you can't reach that you have to hit whether it's a switch on a wall or an enemy that's flying right your melee weapon is just not going to be capable of doing the job sometimes so a wand is really good to have just in case even if you're using a bow you know just in case you run out of arrows now the third one is probably the most confusing this is a staff now the way staves work in this game is pretty interesting so in order to use your staff you have to get spells and spells work as a form of ammunition in this game so right here i have a stack of heal channel i have 48 charges of this spell you can craft these charges you can find them in chess you can find them off of enemies but each time you use the spell it consumes one charge so that's one type then there's another type while you're questing and stuff you'll find what are called eternal spells and these are ones that you can cast unlimited they don't require charges but they're always going to cost mana so on this one if i use it it's going to throw two little heal orbs out three four right and each one of those ate some of my charges so right now i have 44 charges left you can see it down there at the bottom and if i use it you can see it counting down and there now I'm down to 42 charges and each one of those is healing me for a good chunk of health there. It's a really nice spell to have on hand. Even if you're not planning on using the staff offensively, it can be nice for healing yourself in a pinch and putting your mana to use somehow, some way. If we look in my stash here, we can see I have a ton of other spells just kind of sitting here waiting to be used. I've got Fireball 1, Fireball 2, I've got Eternal Ice Bolts, and Chain Lightning. So Eternal Ice Bolt would be a great example of one that I can just slot and cast. So in order to use it, what I'm going to have to do is right click it and equip. Now that means whenever our, my staff is being used, it's going to use that spell. There it goes, shooting those ice balls and I get to use it unlimited time. But you'll see in the top left, my mana is getting chunked down, right? It is costing mana to use the spell. So that's going to be the thing that limits you even with the eternal spells. All right, now if we look at the fourth slot on the bar, you can see bandages. Bandages are really nice. So if we look at bandages, it says 4% healing per second. So these are great because they scale with you, right? 4% is always gonna be a considerable amount of health. It restores 40% of your health over 10 seconds. And it does have a very brief cast time. So you can use this in combat real easily. You just kind of have to sprint away, use it, and then boom, now you're running around and you're getting 40% of your health back, right? So really useful to have bandages. Make sure to craft yourself some they're real easy to craft you go into your crafting menu the basic one and right here bandages and you just space right and you craft them it only takes one torn cloth which you're gonna find tons of basically every other enemy you kill it feels like especially in the early game drops torn cloth it's gonna be everywhere plus string which you can get from these plants outside like we mentioned before right you just run around you pick up the fiber 
right? I'm getting twigs. That's great for those arrows and um, other things. And then the plant fibers, which I can come in here, string, right? Create string out of the plant fibers. And then boom, I'm making bandages. No problem. Now, next to that, we have potions. Potions are pretty OP in this game, man. So if we look at this potion right here, it's 200 health. Early on, that is a lot. And if we open up our character screen here, we can see that we only have 355 health. And so that's an instant heal. Boom, you press it, it's done. And these potions are really, really inexpensive to make. So always try to have some on you for when you need them. And then you can come to this guy right here. I'll talk about how to get these NPCs in a moment. I know you're probably wondering who the heck they are if you haven't been playing the game already. But you come in here and health potions right there you've got one and two and that's actually a good time to mention that when you're in these crafting menus you see this two here that means there's two different things there so you might have to tab between the two of them or click between them to see all of the crafting options that are available to you now this greater health potion is a little bit more work to get because you have to have chamomile but the basic one red mushrooms purple berries and water purple berries and water you'll find tons of red mushrooms also you'll find tons of so that means that you know these are really easy to make you should always have a couple on you at least and next to that speaking of which we've got the berries so berries in this game are going to be really useful early on you get two health per second which ends up being a great in combat heal over time because it's going to give you two health per second over 30 seconds so you can be running from an enemy you can pop one of those and boom you're getting health back now in the top there you can see we have three circles one of which is counting down right now and that has the berry right and it's almost done that's the berry that I just ate. You can have up to three food buffs at a time. Water is a great one to use early on. Berries are a great one to use early on. And then also some kind of cooked meat. So you'll find meat all over the game. When you're killing wildlife, you're going to get meat. And what you do is you come to a fire, you sit down in front of it, and then you choose that item on your bar down at the bottom. So here's where I'm, my raw meat, right? And then I just hold the mouse button down on PC and boom, there, it's done. Now you have to let it go the second it finishes. Otherwise you will overcook it and turn it into tar, which isn't always a bad thing if you need tar. But when you're looking for food, you know, you don't want to overcook it. You want to make sure you let go as soon as it's done now if you eat this food raw it's going to give you a debuff instead it's giving you food poisoning it's hurting you it's actually not great so be careful about eating raw food now when i cook that food we've got grilled game here and this is giving me three constitution and this is a good time to talk about how much more important that is than it sounds okay now by default our character has three constitution right now. At the beginning of the game, I believe you have one or two, right? You These numbers are very low. So when food is giving you three, it's doubling your constitution. And at the bottom there, when I hover over it, you can see it says increases health by 50 per point. And remember, my health is, I only have 355 health. So if I get three constitution, I'm getting 150 more health. That's a massive buff. So food buffs are not to be underestimated. These things are huge, huge, huge in this game. And just to show you how big it is, I'm actually wearing some heavy armor. So it's not going to look as impactful as it will for you, most likely, especially if you're not running heavy. But here, we'll eat the food. And there you go. We got a big chunk extra health. Yeah, when we come into the menu, now we have 505 health. So we're a big beefy boy at this moment. And then the other food that I always recommend to have like I mentioned, is water. Water is going to be great for increasing your endurance and your stamina charges. So it's basically, you know, stamina is everything in this game when it comes to combat, unless, you know, you're a magic attune. But even then, you need it for all sorts of stuff. You need it for sprinting. That drains it. Jumping, double jumping, gliding, all of that good stuff. Now, the next item on the bar is grenades. You'll find these grenades all over the game, explosive powder balls, as it calls them. And these are great for if you have a massive pack of spiders following you and you'd rather just kill them all in one go or if you want to blow up terrain. So let's say you find a wall and you're very suspicious that on the other side of this rubble is a prize, right? Or a room to be explored. You can throw a couple of those grenades at it. And if that was the intention of the devs is to, that there was something secret on the other side, usually two grenades will be enough for you to know for sure there is or there isn't something on the other side. So that'll probably be what you primarily use them for. Now, in a pinch, if you don't have them, you can just pull out the old trusty pickaxe. You can dig the ground out. <laughs> There, I just dug a hole. I'm going to regret that later because I'm probably going to constantly step in it. Okay, 
So right now it's nighttime and you're very rarely going to want to run around at night because it's just, you know, it's harder to see. So the way day and night works in this game is you come to your bed and anytime you're not in your bed, time is passing regularly, right? And then you get in your bed. If it's nighttime in the top left there, you see it says night speed 60. So nighttime is passing at 60 the speed. Boom. Now it's over, right? So it goes at 60 X while you're laying in the bed. And then as soon as you see that 60 X disappear from the top, that means it's daytime now you can get out of the bed and now you've got a full day ahead waiting you the other great thing about getting into your bed is it instantly you'll see there in the top left you see it says rested 22 minutes so i have 22 minutes of rested buff and if i leave the house here you can see that it's counting down now i've got 21 minutes of rested left so if we open up and show status details we can see rested what does that do it increases our stamina our maximum and our regeneration. So we have a higher stamina pool and we have higher stamina regeneration, which is critical for being in combat because you're going to find in combat, you're constantly running, you're constantly moving, you're draining your stamina, you're dodge rolling, right? That's going to drain your stamina. And so that buff is more or less essential to being efficient out there. You can absolutely go without it, but it's a good reason to come back to your base and mind your base every once in a while and maybe catch a rest, change it to daytime again, and, and drop off all of your stuff that you've collected out there. Because remember what I said, I said, pick up everything that you walk by. Now, you're obviously going to have to be a little bit strategic about this. If you have a ton of something, maybe don't pick it up unless you know you need it. And if you're just finding something for the first time, pick as much of it up as you can so that you can have a full stack of it in your crates in your base. You will be glad you did that because every time I ran by something later on, you know, an hour or two or five hours later, one of these NPCs in here said, hey, I need you to make something. And it requires that ingredient that you totally ran by earlier and you didn't pick enough of it up. So definitely pick up everything. You'll be thanking yourself if you do now continuing around the screen here in the top right, we have the quest and we can press J. And this is going to bring up this menu here. You can see the flame. This is going to tell you what level your flame is and what you need to upgrade it. You can see your craftspeople's progress in here. You can see what they have. So we have the mortar, but we don't have the alchemy station or the laboratory. This guy has the forge, but he doesn't have his smelter or his smithing tools, right? And so every time you get one more of those things, you unlock more of the crafting tree, more things that you can make with these craftspeople. Those are items that you'll find as part of their quest lines. You've got your workshops. This is basically just a place where you can see anytime you unlock new things that you can craft, you can click on here and then they'll have the yellow diamond next to them. If it's something that's new, we click on it. Now that's gone, right? And then most importantly, you've got quests. Now quests, there's a few different types. So there's going to be your gold quests. These are going to be the ones that are primary objectives. They're more or less tutorial level things or essential for progressing through the game. You'll have those gold quests. Those are something you should always do anytime they're available. Then you've got these ones here, these ones up here. They're light blue, I guess we'll call that, and then dark blue. So the light blue ones, these are your craftspeople quests. These are the quests you have to do to proceed with their quest lines and unlock more things that you can craft from them, right? These are very essential. I would say these are almost as critical to do as your gold quest. So try to stay on top of these anytime they're available. You're going to want to keep kind of pushing them and they're going to be great for pushing you out into the game. Sometimes these quests will push you farther than you're ready to travel. And you'll know that usually because you'll get to a red fog or a red shroud that doesn't let you proceed. There's two types of shroud in this game. There is the blue shroud right there, which you can see see that cloud this fog of blue shroud right there that is fine we can walk in there and our shroud meter will start ticking down no big deal right we've got five and a half minutes of shroud we're gonna be fine we can run around explore and the second we dip our toes back out the timer goes away and you know we're breathing fine again the other one is red when you see red shroud you've got about two maybe three seconds to get out of it after you step into it or you die and that's the game's way of saying you're not ready to go past this yet so how will you eventually pass the red shroud well you just have to upgrade your flame right you come here strengthen the flame and it says shroud passage level it's currently three you take it to four boom now that red shroud that you couldn't get through because it killed you instantly is blue and you can get through it 
So that's kind of the progression of the game. You'll start exploring out and out and out and the shroud will be blue and then you'll eventually get to a line of shroud and it's red and you can't get through it. So there you go. Here's some red, right? And you step into that and you die. Red is dead in this game in a lot of cases, not just the shroud, but also if you see lava on the ground, something that looks like lava, do not step in that. It is an instant death. I won't be surprised if the developers change that. But right now, if you see that stuff, do not touch it and keep a wide berth. If you do touch it, if your toe even looks at it, you will die. You'll kill over and die. It's instant, man. So I think I touched it once without surviving. It had like 1% health left. I don't know how I survived because never again did that happen. So back to the quest, the light blue ones here at the top, these are going to be your craftspeople ones. These are going to unlock more stuff. And then below that, these are the quests you'll find all over the game. And there's there's going to be little lore notes you find, these red glowing lore notes. This time, red is good. So you see a red glowing note, go talk to it. Always touch it, read it. And what that's going to do is it's going to put a symbol on the map with a question mark. It'll put like a diamond here with question marks, for instance. And that's the game's way of revealing these locations to you before you have found them. And it'll usually say something like if we look at one of them, the equipment chest was taken and subsequently lost. Reach his former camp and unearth the equipment chest to claim its contents. So there's a hint here. One, that it's kind of buried. And two, if we press F to show on map, it's showing us right here. It's right in this area. Oswald Anders chest. So we run over there and we dig up his chest, get his loot and unlock that point of interest there. So that's what these dark blue quests, that's just points of interest and a little bit of a reward. So the game kind of sends you there and it rewards you for going there. Sometimes it's a chest, sometimes it's XP, sometimes it's a legendary bow, right? What the heck? I need to go do this right now. So sometimes it's stuff like that. Generally speaking, it's going to be a good idea to try to do all of them, but it will be very easy to fall behind if you're just doing these ones at the top, you know, your gold ones and your light blue ones. You're doing those. You're going to constantly be stumbling across those places. And every time you stumble into one of these places, you'll find a red note there and you'll read it and it'll give you another quest and you'll go to the next place. It'll give you another quest to so go to another place. Right. And so the game is always putting a carrot on the stick for you. And there's one more thing that you can see here and you see these exclamation points. You'll see these sometimes you'll see them in the quest menu. Sometimes you'll see them when you're talking to the craftspeople or on an item that you can craft. And that just means that it's kind of essential that you do that to progress with them. Sometimes it's essential that you craft a specific item before they'll be willing to move forward with their quest line. Or sometimes it says, you know, you need to do this quest so we can continue the quest line. So that's the journal in the top right. In the middle of the screen here, continuing the UI, you've got your compass, which works exactly the way you're probably used to compasses working in open world games like this. You've got points of interest. It tells you what direction you're heading. You can come in here and you can just right click on something and then boom, it'll put a gold diamond on it. And then that way you can kind of know that you're constantly running towards it without having to constantly open up your map to make sure. In the top left there, you've got the health. We touched on that already. You've got the blue mana bar below that. Then you've got the rested buff below that. Then you've got the three circles, which are your food buffs. You always want to try to have three of those going, especially in combat. Those things are going to be really powerful for you. Next, let's talk about combat. So the way combat works is enemies will, of course, have a health bar that you're trying to drain to zero. Below that, though, they have a gray bar. This is their daze meter, or their stun meter. You fill it up and they'll be dazed and you get open hits on them. This is especially useful for enemies with shields, right? It makes them drop their guard and then you can wail on them. It's also great for enemies that are relentlessly attacking you. And the way to build that up is to perfectly block. So as soon as they start to swing, you block, not before, not after. And you'll start filling up that daze bar. Alternatively, if they're blocking and you're just wailing away at them, that's going to slowly fill it up as well. So there's multiple ways to fill it up, but when you fill it up, there'll be days and then you can finish them off. Durability in this game is what limits how often you can use a certain type of weapon while you're out in the wild. If you've played Breath of the Wild, it works exactly the same way, except when the item breaks, you can go back to your base and repair it. So if you find a really good weapon that you love, you can always repair it and reuse it. You don't lose it when it breaks. So don't stress if it breaks, it's OK. You just got to make a trip back to your base and repair it. But this is why it's really important to have multiple weapons on hand, because your weapons will absolutely break when you're out there on the go or, you know, you go. If you leave the base for more than 30 minutes, something's going to break on you. One of your weapons is going to break. I guarantee it, if not multiple weapons. Right. And so you're going to have to start switching to those backups. Also in combat, you have dodge roll. This is very effective getting you out of damage and doing it quickly, but it eats up your stamina bar. So just be aware of that. You've got jump. You can jump over a lot of attacks in this game. And especially if you have the double jump, you can do that. 
Double jump is goaded, by the way. Unlock it. I would even say unlock this first thing. It's great for combat. It's great for getting away from enemies. It's great for exploring. It's just great all around. You want to have it. It's, I would say, even essential. I'll tell you how to unlock that in one second. And then you've got your block. It absorbs all direct damage. So if something's hitting you with a single target attack, like an arrow, or they're hitting you with their sword, or they're hitting you with some kind of single target projectile, right? Your shield is going to block it. If they throw an AOE ability at you, that's going to chunk you down. That's still going to hurt you. So just you'll very quickly learn what's what, you know, by trying to block things. Just be aware that the shield will block 100% of incoming damage for the right attack and it won't for the wrong attacks. Now let's talk about that skill tree that we touched on a moment ago here. Okay, look at this bad boy. So one of the first things you'll notice is the text all the way around the edge. For some reason, they don't let us zoom out. I hate when games kind of artificially try to make this thing feel bigger than it is by pushing your screen in so you can't if we could zoom out just a little more we'd get oh we'd be able to see the whole thing at once which is i guess what they don't want us to be able to do and we'd still be able to use it just fine so that really minor rant aside because i do love everything about this game I, i'm having an absolute blast so <laughs> don't be fooled what you can see around the screen here is we've got beastmaster ranger assassin trickster wizard healer battle mage tank warrior barbarian athlete right and you can spec into multiple of these lines this is really it's kind of like a mini path of exile tree right you don't start as a class you don't play a class you just kind of build into class like passives that will eventually kind of define your character and make it unique to you so in this case i've gone with a lot of archery skills here and i use my bow quite a bit in combat and it's going to give me things like increased damage against flying enemies because those are some of the most dangerous in the game as it happens right so i like that all range damage is increased by 20 percent right lots of damage buffs and then here occasionally we'll spawn a flurry of arrows that spread slightly so a nice little multi-shot 20 percent of the time feels really good right? and so there's you can kind of build into this tree and i won't be surprised you know this is early access i won't be surprised if they expand on this some as the game goes on because right now it's really really fun to interact with and to and to kind of fill out so which nodes on here would i say are essential well first of all it's going to be double jump i think this should more or less be the first thing that you unlock because if you don't there's going to be some cool place that you can't get to because you don't have double jump unlocked right there's you're going to see something up there you're going to see a ledge you're going to see a shortcut and you'll be like ah oh, man it's just out of reach well double jump would have made it possible and in a game that is built around exploration anything you can get in this tree to help with exploration is really useful so double jump and then updraft updraft i would also say is more or less essential it's not nearly as useful as double jump but it is still for the points that it costs you to unlock it it's totally worth it you can go any which way in this tree that you want to you know red is going to be kind of your melee green is kind of your agility ranged kind of thing plus beast master stuff going on over here and then you've got your magic -y, you know blue names over here right so have fun with this because you can respec it anytime for next to nothing so the way you respect is you come back to this little shrine right here this very important thing, right? This thing that we have been upgrading so that we can explore the world more. Well, it's also got this last option, reset, reset skill points. So we click that and it says 10 runes. I have 1,610, so I've got more than enough, right? I can respect multiple times, right? So it's really cheap to respect. So don't stress about this treat. Just put points somewhere. Just put them somewhere. Pick the stuff that sounds fun. And then later you can respect, you know, when you're getting to the end of the game and you have a better idea of what weapons you want to use, what skills you want to use, what gear you want to wear, right? Then you can come here, respect, and make it exactly the way that you want to make it. But in the meantime, just have fun. Pick the fun stuff because, yeah, you know, there's a lot of really cool abilities in there. Let me tell you. Now, you're probably wondering, okay, so how do you get these runes? What are those about? Well, the runes come in a couple of ways. You can kill enemies and they'll sometimes drop runes. But one of the most common ways that you're going to get them is from breaking down weapons so you'll find weapons in the game and a lot of times most of the time even they're going to be worse than what you're already wearing and so this isn't quite as depressing as normal because you can right click on them and you can click salvage you can't click salvage if it's equipped so the game kind of protects you from salvaging the one you're using so if we unequip this and we click salvage boom it's going to give me 69 more of those runes those runes have another purpose though that is equally important if not more so so you can upgrade your weapons and depending on the tier of the weapon, right, whether it's blue, purple or gold, right, they have different levels of upgrades. You can see here each time we upgrade what we would unlock. So the blue one gets three upgrades. The purple one here 
gets four. We would get those four things. And then the gold one gets five upgrades. And so you just come and you talk to any craftsperson. You click enhance and it's going to show you what's in your backpack, what's in your action bar. The circles tell you if it's been upgraded or not. So it's got white dots inside of the circles. That means those slots have been upgraded. So if we click on this one that has not been frozen and we hit space to enhance here, it tells us we're going to get eight ice magic protection. So we clicked it. Boom. Now we've got one filled in and it has now been enhanced. We can do it again and again and again and again. Right. And now it's maxed out. We've got that maxed out here. The damage has gone up to 40. It was 32. It's a nice jump for that damage. It's a good percentage upgrade, right? And we've got leech and we're leeching some of the damage back as mana, right? Great for a mage build. So that kind of covers what you use runes for and how you use runes. Now, since we keep talking to these NPCs here, let me just talk about them and how we get them. Uh, what's going to happen is you're going to be playing the game and you're going to get these quests. And they're going to tell you to go to this place. This is ancient vault blacksmith. You're going to go into this ancient vault. You're going to open up this metal egg and there's going to be a blacksmith inside. And then you're going to go to another one, right? The game's going to say, hey, go over here and get the carpenter. So you'll go there. You'll get the carpenter. And after that, you will also be given the summoning staff. You'll use this summoning staff. You just put it on your bar, pull it out, and then you get to summon these people. You get to click on it and then it lets you put them in your base somewhere. They like to be inside, most of them. If you don't put them inside, you won't be able to continue your quest. So there's a lot of reasons to make your house a little bit bigger. I'm going to dive more into that when I go full in on the housing section here in a moment. But just know that you, you want to make your house a decent size because one, you have tons of crafting stuff. You have these NPCs that want to be in here, but also um, something else that's really cool. So we'll get in that in a second. Uh, but these NPCs, you're just going to go, you're going to pick them up and then you're going to do the quests that show up in your journal to progress your progress with them. And that's going to keep giving you more things that you can craft whenever you interact with them. Like this one, it wants me to craft this spiritual cane. So let's go ahead and do that. Boom. So he's really happy now. And once I've done all of his quests and crafted everything that he wants me to craft, we'll be able to proceed. We'll be able to go on to the next quest or we'll be able to craft the next thing. And this applies to all of these NPCs in here. So what does each of these NPCs do? Well, there's one major difference between each of them. They let you craft different types of armor. So one is going to help you craft armor for being a mage. One is going to help you craft armor for being a warrior. And another will be helping you craft armor that is great for being an archer, right? So there are different types of armor in this game that are suited towards different types of builds. And if we look at them, we can see here. So let's look at the ranger set and the ranger set. You'll get your user usual stats. So physical resistance, 18, magical resistance, 18. But below that, you get really important stat, 13% ranged critical strike chance. So that buff right there is what really separates this from the buffs you'll see on the other sets. So 13% range critical strike chance, the chest, 24 stamina, right? Because you do need stamina, fire a bow. And then you've got 3% range damage. You've got nine stamina and two stamina regeneration. So it's just really built for being an archer and whereas if we come to this guy here he's got a mage set and if we look at the mage 13 percent magical critical strike chance 48 mana right you can see how it's kind of similar but it's very much tailored towards being a magic user magic regeneration so you can one of the things you can do since classes are not defined right they're very undefined you play a little bit of a ranger and a little bit of warrior you can make a warrior and then if you need more mana regen you can put on these boots so that you have two extra mana regen which is no joke that's a good chunk of mana regen likewise you can put on the warrior boots on your mage and have two health regen it feels really good your health will always be regenerating in or out of combat if you're wearing these boots that you can make over here at the blacksmith so he's got his rising fighter set which gives you melee crit chance that's right one for the boots and then you can have a ring on which gives you another health regeneration that's where i got the two from so these crafts people are helping you craft different types of armor for your character and so you're gonna want to get the armor that is suited towards you the farther into the game you get the more sets that will be available to you at first you're only going to be able to make this full armor set right actually before that you won't even be able to make that you'll be able to make the first thing you'll be able to make is rags this one right here you'll be able to make this nice set of rags that gives you you 
17 physical and 17 magical resistance. Can this even be called a shirt? And that's all it's giving you. It's There's no bonus stats associated with it. It's just flat fizz and mag resistance. That's it. On top of that, these crafts people are also going to do things like we touched on earlier. They're going to help you craft potions, mana potions, shroud survival flasks, right? If you ever find yourself in a pinch down in the shroud and you need more time, this will be great. I haven't really had a problem with that. Usually if I'm down there, there's somewhere where I can run to go be above the shroud for a second to get my breath back, if we want to call it that, get the meter down. And two more minutes is rarely going to be the thing I need. Wisp of Light, this is going to give you a nice little light that floats around you. I haven't really used this because... We've got torches in the game. These are really easy to make. You'll find more than you need probably. And so I'm never without a torch. It's always there somewhere. The downside of the torch is that you can't have it out you know, while you're attacking. So it just so happens that I have this weapon it has a nice glow to it. So I can kind of, while I'm using this thing, it is starting to get a bit low level for me, but I do like the way that it lights up the area around me just a little bit. You know, it lets me get by without that torch more than I probably should. So that's when that's going to be really useful. You've got this flask of fell. This gives you 20 extra stamina, which is pretty good. Um, you know, nothing to sneeze at. It's all right. I don't really use that one much either. And then here you can also craft your spells and other reagents. And like we touched on, your kind of magic armor. At the hunter, you can craft something really, really, really important. And that's your small backpack. So one of the first things you want to do is when the game says, hey, go over here when you're ready to go get your hunter. Like as soon as the game mentions the hunter, go get them. And that way you can start doing their quest chain and unlock the small backpack. And that's going to be really nice to have. Now, the hardest part about getting the small backpack is getting the dried fur. You're going to have tons of torn cloth. You're going to have tons of string and you're just going to need some dried fur. So with dried fur being the only thing that's hard to get, you're going to need a drying rack. And then once you build your drying rack, you need animal fur and salt. So whenever you have something like this, it's a good time to talk about this. Whenever you have these crafting benches like this, if you open it up and right here, you can browse the recipes and it tells you exactly what you need to put in there to get that thing going. And in the case of the dried fur, it tells us that we need animal fur and salt. Animal fur, you're going to have tons of salt. This like salt very early in the game is a little bit tricky because uh, you may not have found some yet or when you ran by it, you forgot to hit it with your pickaxe. But just so you know, right here, right northwest of Peaceful Acres, you'll head here very early in the game. You'll be in this area. And right here, there's going to be like a little ravine. You'll see it. It's glowing blue. Go down in there. There's salt in the bottom. Tons and tons and tons of it. And get yourself multiple stacks because you're going to need it. And you're going to need it to make this small backpack. So go there and get that very early on. It's just right, just barely northwest of where you start, right? You'll run into Peaceful Acres and it'll be right there. Grab that salt and you'll have your bag right away. And that's going to feel good. It's going to give you eight extra slots. And because, like I said, you never want to run by materials without gathering them, your inventory is always going to be full, just like mine is right now. And I'll talk about how to manage that in a moment here, because there's some really cool tricks, some really cool hotkeys to make managing your inventory a lot easier. If we come to the next one here, we've got our farmer and she's just going to help you, you know, if you want to make seed beds and then you want to grow a specific plant, like we said, we needed chamomile to make potions, right? So we could put chamomile in here and then harvest that over and over so that we didn't have to go out into the wild to find our chamomile. It's really nice that kind of stuff then you've got your blacksmith blacksmith is going to help you make weapons you know your one-handed weapons your shields he's also going to give you your warrior your like heavier armor right and even things like saw blades or charcoal kilns where you make your charcoal right your forge where you can make some of those items right so he's giving you the benches and he's also giving you the things that you make with those benches then you've got your carpenter he's going to get you that table saw we just kind of mentioned kiln as well as a lot of furniture and you're looking at this furniture and you're like oh are we just supposed to rp in this game and the answer is kind of no yes so you'll see next to each piece of furniture it says plus three to comfort we click on the next one plus two to comfort so the way comfort in this game works is really cool actually it's kind of incentivizing you it makes it worth it to craft these things that you might otherwise never even think about putting in your house if you're someone that traditionally doesn't get too into decorating their house so uh, you'll see back here i have a bunch of stuff kind of just stacked here i need to make my house bigger in order to kind of neatly do it but when i go to the fire it says comfort level 17 and that's what's determining how long my rest 
rested buff lasts. Right now it lasts 22 minutes. If I go here to the carpenter and I craft a bunch more stuff and put it in the house and get my comfort level up, right? So the ones that add three comfort are going to increase the duration of my buff more than the ones that add two comfort, right? So the more, the better, but you can only put one of each item in your house. It doesn't, so you can't just sit there and pump out like 20 tables and then have 40 comfort, right? It doesn't let you do that. What you could do is you could do one of these wooden side tables, then you could do one wooden table, then you could do one wooden banquet table, right? You can do one of each and put them all in your house and it's gonna keep stacking up that comfort for each one and then your buff is gonna last longer and longer. And like I said, you kind of don't really wanna be out in the wild without that buff. You can, but it's a lot less efficient. You're gonna run out of stamina just trying to run up a hill or just trying to run to your next location. Your stamina is gonna run dry or when you're trying to glide, it's gonna burn through your stamina faster, right? You kinda always want that buff up just because of how easy it is to have it. And then finally, so speaking of that buff being a reason you kinda wanna return home, let's Let's talk about your gameplay loop what it's going to kind of look like and feel like and why. So you're going to run out into the world. You're going to explore, right? You're going to go out here. You're going to go, you know, follow the question marks like I have up higher here. You'll have question marks like this and you'll go out to those locations. You'll find what's there. Maybe find the secret item, the legendary bow, the, you know, purple sword, whatever's there. You'll find it. And then your rested buff will be draining. Your gear will need to be repaired. Your inventory will almost certainly be overflowing with items. So you're going to have to come back just to drop off everything in your inventory if nothing else and remember you always want to be picking up so you want to come back often to drop off and fast travel is easy in this game you know you can always teleport right back to your base you just click on it and anyone that is yellow like this is a fast travel location but i'll talk more about that in a second because i want to try to stay on topic here so the gameplay loop so you'll come back to your base and when you're here you're going to come to your benches and what you can do is shift R. See what it says right here? Shift R. If you're on console, it'll tell you what the buttons are right here. And we press shift R and it's boom. It's automatically going to move anything that already has a stack in this container over, right? So I just come to each container. I shift R. What I have left is not crafting materials. These are things I put over here. And then I got some legendary stuff that I've been putting over here right now, right? And so my inventory went from full to empty just like that. Just a few clicks. So our inventory sorted. The next thing we're going to want to do is come to this bench. This bench has multiple purposes, right? One is you can craft basic items with it. Two, it repairs all your weapons the second you touch it for free every time you touch it. So you can see my wand has lost a bunch of its durability. That green bar down there at the bottom is not all the way full, whereas the sword is, right? So all we do is we come here and we talk to this. Boom, it's full. Everything got repaired while this menu was opening up. So we can just close that. And that's the second thing we always want to make sure we do. Of course, talk to any NPCs. Sometimes they'll have quests for you to do. You'll see a red exclamation point over their head. Pick that up. You know, accept the quest. It's going to put more markers on your map for you to go explore. There's never going to be a shortage of markers on your map for you to explore. If we open up my map, you can see them all over the place. And then another thing you want to do is make sure you have lock picks on you. So if you need to go ahead and craft some lock picks while you're here and nothing feels worse than finding a chest that you can't open or a door that you can't get past because you don't have lock picks. Although I will say if you run into a door that is locked, <laughs> if you run into a door that's locked and it's made out of wood, just pull out your axe baby and chop that thing down it works like a charm i tested it and after you get your lock picks make some bandages if you need more bandages potions if you need more potions right and then stock up on food if you need to stock up on food you know food piles can be pretty big they last a long time you most likely won't have to touch your food piles more than once every like 10 trips out five trips out something like that so coming back to your base 99 percent of the time is just going to be hitting your storage containers hitting your repair bench and then heading back out that's what it's going to look like when you come back here. And so it only takes one second. So definitely, definitely do it. Don't leave things on the ground because you didn't want to make a quick trip back to the base. You're going to regret it. So now let's talk about fast travel because fast travel in this game is kind of unique. It's got your typical fast travel in that you can teleport back to your home. Cool. So you'll notice, though, there's lots of these dark yellow diamonds on the map, and that's because you've got these ones here, these ancient spires. These are quests that we get sent to and you climb up this giant tower that's basically a massive jump puzzle. You're jumping over spikes, you're climbing up ledges. You're not fighting things inside as much as you're just navigating a giant tower and finding a way up it, finding switches, finding chests. There's lots of loot inside. And when you get to the top, 
and you touch the beacon, you can fast travel to it and it lights up. So we've got that one there. We've got this one here, but we've also got other teleport points. Home. So you see home level one, home level one, home level two. Oh, it's because I built this one over here. We can get rid of this, which is a good time to talk about this one. So I made this one so I could technically teleport to that one over there or I could teleport to this one over here and you can do this from anywhere. You don't have to be standing at it to teleport, right? You can just teleport from anywhere out in the open as long as you're not inside the shroud. So if you're standing in that blue shroud and the meters up, you will not be able to fast travel. So you got to make your way out of the shroud above it somewhere. There's always they always have some place in the shroud that has like a peak that is above the shroud. There will be a little tower in there. You can climb your way up and then you've got the fresh air and now you can fast travel if you need to or you can just reset your meter. There's always something you can do inside of there to get out if you need to. But but once you're out, you can fast travel. So these altars you can build real easy, right? These only cost five stones. So here's how hard it is to get five stone. One, two. Okay, I just got six stone. So now I would be able to go into my crafting, make a flame altar, space, made it, drag it onto my bar, and boom. Now I can put a fast travel location down. Now I can't because I've used all of my altars. I'd have to get rid of that one over there first. So you basically get to plant fast travel locations anywhere in the game that you want. And that's what you're gonna use these alternate altars for is you're going to place them as forward operating bases. You're not necessarily going to need to make a base at them because it's so easy to teleport. Like if you're going to teleport back home, you might as well teleport to your base with everything. You don't need to teleport to your forward operating base. And then you'll teleport to the forward operating base when you want to go back out into the field. Because sometimes like when I was over here, it would have been nice to put down a pad because this is a good five to 10 minute run to get back to where I was. So if I had found a place to build an altar over there while I was there, I would have done that. And then I could just teleport back to where I am and I don't have to make this five to 10 minute run to get back. So sometimes your teleport points can be very spaced out. And that's where your altars come in to kind of fill that gap until you stretched that next ancient spire. At first, you can't have very many altars, but every time you level it up, Right here, you see flame altar, strengthen the flame. When you level it up, yeah, altar activation capacity it goes from six to seven. So each time you upgrade it, you get more altars that you can build out in the wild. Now, eventually, you're going to build an altar like this one right here. Let's say I didn't need it anymore or, well, this one in my base. You want to build another one way out farther in front. You don't want this one anymore because you found a spire that you can teleport to past it. So it's kind of not needed anymore, right? So you just come to the altar and you click extinguish flame and it's going to say attention extinguishing the flame will reset the currently protected area after some time or with the next start of the game so that's fine and then it says it's going to happen in 28 seconds so we'll let that count down here using some editing magic we'll skip right to it boom there it is now it's gone and we could go run out to that place we were earlier and slam one down so that we can use it to teleport back to our base, drop off all our goods, and then teleport right back to where we were to continue exploring into the darkness. Okay, So that's how fast travel works in the game. It's free, it's almost instant, and you can do it anytime you're not inside of the shroud. So use it often, teleport back to your base often, and drop off all your goods. Next, let's talk about the map a little bit because we keep opening it up and there's a lot of good information on here, a lot of really important information actually okay so you've got the yellow ones these dark yellow ones here these are places that you can teleport to then you've got the blue ones these are little towns that you can find little settlements abandoned settlements whatever they're little points of interest that you can go to and find treasure items whatever you know it's just a little point of interest you've got the gray ones these are your crafts people related ones you've got these light yellow ones right that's why i keep calling these dark yellow because these light yellow ones these are flame shrines you go to these and you just touch them and it gives you a spark and you can go and you can touch it and get a spark every time you reboot the game you can go back to the same shrine and get a spark and you need these sparks for various things in the game whether it's upgrading your shrine or crafting or whatever you you'll need you'll need these sparks so if you ever need sparks you know go to the shrines go touch these shrines you can go and touch all of the different shrines or you could go and touch the same shrine over and over every time you reset the game whichever is easier for you next we have these green ones these are like like little farmlands you can see they've got the little carrot in them little farms you've got ancient obelisks you just go and you touch these there'll be quests associated with that you've got the scavenger stashes these are like generally filled with enemies you can go to them 
fight your way through it and get a reward. And then you've got these ones here, the maybe most important ones on the screen right now. That's the purple ones, these purple or pink ones, whatever you want to call that. This is how you get skill points to use in your tree. So there's two ways to get skill points. One is just leveling, just like you would expect. So you level up, you get some skill points. Alternatively, you can just run to one of these purple places and you chop down the red root, the shroud root, as it's called, and you get a skill point instantly the first time that you chop it down. If it has a little check mark next to it, that means you have chopped it down and got that skill point. This one does not have the check mark, which means I have not gone there and got that skill point. I kind of left that there for this video so we could kind of demonstrate that, right? So perfect. Similarly, you can see this check marks will tell you that other things are done. So there's a lot of good information on the map. Mostly your map's going to look like this when you start. And just for just look at how big this map is. OK, so this here is a lot of hours in the game. What I've done so far, just so many hours. And then it just keeps going up, man. This game is going to be huge because remember, this is early access, so we don't have access to the full game yet, but we have access to a lot of it. And what we have access to is phenomenal. Absolutely love it. So it's uh, you've got a lot of fun ahead of you. Let me just say so you're going to be working your way out to these questions marks most of the time you're going to see one of these out in the distance you're going to run to it if you ever see one of these towers so we let's look real quick see that right there see that tower that giant tower just kind of making itself known off in the distance right here you always want to go to those when you see them if you can sometimes the shroud between you and it will be red which means it's too high level for you at the moment right now see this is blue so i could go down in there no problem there's another tower right there so you'd want to go to that climb your way to the top and the, every time you do that it unlocks it as a fast travel location and it lights up up key interest points around it that you can go and travel to and beyond running to those it's just a matter of you know opening up your journal click on a quest and then click show where it is on the map and it's gonna say go here and you're like okay cool and then you run your way over there and you knock out that quest and just go from one to the next but always remember to prioritize those gold quests remember to prioritize your craftspeople quests because you're gonna be really sad if you get far into the game and you realize oh man i wish i had that extra storage bag so i could hold more items but i haven't even started that quest for that uh craftsperson yet next let's just quickly touch on the backpack and how it works so you're going to fill up your backpack when you pick up items of course this last row here is because of that storage bag that i got from that lady and later on you'll be able to get a bigger storage bag and hold more items down here you've got your two bars of weapons items whatever you choose to put down here you can i even have dirt here i don't really need it there i have a flame altar just in case i want to put one down when i'm out and about again it's always nice to have one of those in case you need it although in a pinch it's usually not too hard to find five stone like i demonstrated but that's more or less, you know, your bag, your backpack here. You've got the character screen, which we we've used a couple of times, but I haven't really dove into it. So you've got your bow, right? So you can click on these slots and it'll tell you everything that you could put there. We could put there the bows. We could put the staff. We could put this cane. You can equip one of those there and that makes it so that whenever you hold Q, it automatically pulls out that weapon. That way you don't have to hit like number four and then, you know, draw your bow back. It just you hold it down and boom, it's already aiming for you then below that you've got your shield you want to equip a shield you always want to have a shield equipped no matter what your build let me tell you because whenever you're using a wand it's automatically going to pull the shield out as your offhand or whenever you're using a one-handed weapon the shield's automatically going to come out when able if you're wearing a staff or like a two-handed weapon then the shield's not going to come out below that we have our bag we've got the small backpack right now we'll later on get a bigger one hold more items below that we've got the glider and the grappling hook and you'll be able to upgrade these so this is a tier two grappling hook right here it costs less to use because it costs stamina like everything costs stamina in this game so your glider costs stamina your grappling hooks cost stamina sprinting costs stamina jumping dodge rolling right it's all costing stamina and it all chews into how fast you're able to move around the world and uh how much staying power you have in combat Below that, you have rings. You're going to find rings all over the place. You'll find them in chests. You'll find them on enemies. They're very rare, though. I would say that the rings are probably the least found item. Well, I don't find a lot of armor, actually, to be honest. Most of my armor is crafted, but when I do find armor, it's usually pretty good. Like, I got these gloves right here. Those were a nice little upgrade when I found them. It gives 4% magic damage, range damage, and melee damage, whereas my crafted ones, I think, were giving 3% to one of those things. So it was a nice bump up. You'll find gear, but it, you won't find it often. But when you do, there's a good chance it'll be pretty useful. Then over here, you have 
attributes. And I recommend that every once in a while you peek into your attributes and look at the numbers in here so that you understand like, oh man, this item was only giving me one constitution or oh, this passive point is only giving me one constitution. That doesn't sound like a big deal. But then you come in here and you look and you only have one constitution to start with and you realize it's doubling your constitution and giving you way more health than you used to have. And you're like, oh, that one constitution actually is a big deal. And the same goes for all of these stats. So come in here and just kind of see where you're at, get a feel for the value. So when you find an item, you know, oh, well, that's actually a nice jump for me. And you're like, you're, by the way, one nice stat. Look at this sneak attack damage, 900 percent increased damage. And I'm not really doing anything to increase my sneak attack damage on this build. I have not specced into that in the tree. You just start off with 900 percent. And in the tree, you can take passives that can upgrade it 10 times. Right. So you get 10x damage instead of 900 percent. So very big upgrades in there for sneak attacking if you're big on that. And then down here, you've got the C details. This is where you can see buffs, food buffs and your rested buffs. We kind of peeked into here earlier. And if you ever have a buff going and you can't remember what it does, like it's a food buff, you're like, oh man, which food buff is going? I can't remember which one I ate. Just come in here and it'll tell you exactly what the food buff is and what it does. So if we eat real quick, let's go ahead and have a mushroom. And then we come back into the status and it says, I have one extra intelligence because of that mushroom for 10 minutes. Nice. Yeah. And likewise, if you're ever not sure what a food buff is, you can just hover over the item. I don't have a mushroom anymore. Let's see if we hover over these berries. If we click on the berry here, it says two health regen. So you can just click on the food before you use it to find out what it does as well. You don't have to use it and then look. All right, let me travel over to this tower real quick so I can show you something else that's really important to know. So sometimes you'll be in the shroud and you'll see one of these. OK, so these are important for a few reasons. One, these are respawn points. So if you die, you'll go to the last one of these that you ran by if it's closer than any of your other fast travel points. So you're going to respawn here. So you'll see one of these a lot of times before you're about to do something difficult. That's a good sign that something tough is coming or that you need to be careful. Also, you'll see these sometimes in the shroud. And if you come stand up next to it, it resets your shroud meter. So it's a nice little breath of fresh air when you need it sometimes and you can kind of use it as a place that you come back to and refill your shroud meter and then kind of go back out deeper and venture in sometimes you need to use it to get these elixir wells you'll go down 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 inside and then you'll run out of breath and you'll have to come back up run to this thing get your meter back and then head back down in there especially if you don't have any of those elixirs that help you with that down there if you do die you're gonna have to go back and collect your corpse because you're gonna leave a bunch of materials on the ground with it until you collect it. Okay, the next thing I just want to circle back to, oh, lockpick. Yep, yeah, good thing we had one. But if we didn't, we would have been able to break this door down. Also, sometimes there's an alternate way in. So we used a lockpick, but we could have just climbed this, right? Just because you don't have the lockpick doesn't mean you're SOL. So here's a chest, right? It's got a weapon in it. We'll take that. And like we mentioned earlier, when you get extra weapons that you don't need, you can just come into your inventory and here it is here. It put it on my bar. Just be careful of that. Sometimes it'll slam it down there. I move things around. So, OK, so you just right click on it and then salvage and you get the runes, right? So anytime you get that kind of stuff. Now, the next thing is look at how much loot there is in this room. Really nothing, right? Kind of, except we can break these objects in a pinch. Especially early on, this is so useful. So let's pick this up and see what we got. We got metal scraps, metal scraps, wood logs. So early on, metal scraps are a luxury. You're going to use them to craft better armor. You're going to use them to craft better hatchet and pickaxe. You're going to use them for arrows. You're going to use them for all kinds of stuff. And one of the easiest ways to get them is out of these kind of containers where you just break them like that and you get them, even though there's nothing technically there to loot. Same with this. You break this and you're going to get torn cloth. Whenever you see those, it's always going to give you torn cloth when you break it. These books you can dismantle and it's going to give you books, old books like that. Okay. So if you need old books, that's how you get them. You just go and you grab some books. And if we break this, it's probably going to give us, yeah, some wood, right? So breaking the moral of the story is break things, break things and get the materials that are inside. You'll kind of begin to get a feel for what you're going to get when you break certain objects. But that's probably the easiest way to get metal scraps early on. Oh, watch out for these red barrels. These are explosive. So <laughs> you shoot it and it's going to blow up. 
I promise you will die to someone else shooting a barrel next to you. It's a rite of passage in this game. It's brutal when it happens. Just think of this moment and laugh because as mad as you are, I am, I was a hundred times more mad when it happened to me, dude. So I feel your pain. Okay. And then another way to get scrap is killing like these guys here. You can tell they're kind of wearing scrap metal on them. Right. And then if we kill them, maybe we'll get lucky. Yeah, metal scrap. So we got it just like we said. Okay, so this little camp right here, if you need metal scraps early, and you will, Brookmore, right here. It's uh, just northwest of the base. Go there and you'll get some metal scraps. Guarantee it. Lots of it if you break the containers and you kill the people. And there's also some nice little loot hidden in there somewhere. I'm not going to tell you where, though. Now it's nighttime, so let's head back to the base and get rid of the nighttime so that we can see easier. And remember, you come back to the base... You would go and you would just shift R, you would drop all your stuff in here. Inventory problem is instantly solved. You can touch the bench to repair, right? That's your trip back to the base. And then we come to the bed and nighttime is going to pass at 60x. Also, it fully rests you. So if we had just come into the base and stood next to this that rested that says 22 minutes would go up slowly. It would go one, two, three. Or, right, it's going to count up or you can just get on the bed and it instantly fills up. So if you ever it's daytime already, but you want to feel your rested, just come lay on the bed for one second. OK, sun's up. You'll hear the rooster crow. You'll see the sun come up. Also, you'll see the 60 X go away when it's daytime again. Lots of little indicators there. Now, the next thing is you can play fast and loose with gravity in this game. So a lot of times you'll run into a wall that you think you can't get up, but the game has other plans. Well, I think the game has plans for us to not, but we have other plans, right? Because it's just like Skyrim. When you're riding that horse up things, you weren't supposed to be riding it up to save time. Well, we do that in this game a lot too. So once you have your glider, you can kind of manipulate uh, gravity to your will to like, as long as there's an incline, as long as it's not straight up. So let's say you come up to this kind of a spot right here and you don't have double jump yet, right? So you can't make it up. You're like, oh man, wish I could get up there. Well, just use your glider and you can kind of defy gravity. See that? We just ramped up it right there. Even though we couldn't jump up it, even though the glider wouldn't let us get up there, you get this momentum when you use your glider that just kind of propels you up there. There it is. Just like that. So make sure to use that to your advantage. Spam that space bar, or whatever your jump button is on console. And then another cool trick with a glider is you can glide down hills, touching the hill. As long as the hill's going down, it doesn't matter if you're touching it, you'll keep gliding. Okay, so this hill's not very steep, but it doesn't matter. We can still glide down it even when our belly's in the dirt. Look. And as long as you don't hit something, <laughs> you can keep sliding. So if you're ever going down a hill, you know, don't walk. Um, slide on your belly. Yeah. Another quick thing to know about materials that you're gathering is when you see corpses, like you'll see a skeleton sitting there, you can't grab the bones from the skeleton, and you're gonna need bones to make bone mill and other things so when you see a skeleton just smack the skeleton and you'll knock it into bones and then you can collect the bones now earlier i kind of touched on the fact that closing and opening the game resets these flame shrines it also just to be just to make sure you're aware it also resets every chest in the game except for the ones that have dedicated loot like there's some chests that will always have a certain item in them right like it's a legendary item and that chest and that location will always have it if you run there and you grab it that's a thing so those won't reset because you've already got it. But the other ones that just have random items in them, they will reset and each time it will be a different item. So you can farm those chests. You can reset the game. If you've been playing for a really long time and you're running back through areas you've been, but there's nothing to loot because you already looted it, maybe consider rebooting your game, right? Going back out to the menu and opening it up again. And that way all your chests reset. So if you do happen to run by the same area, you can open up that chest again and get a weapon and, you know, turn it into runes. Or, you know, if you're lucky, maybe even get an upgrade. This this will also respawn the mobs that were there too though so just be aware of that another thing to be aware of in this game is that gravity hurts so if it looks like a fall that you wouldn't want to make in real life make sure you don't make it because you can and will die if you take a significant fall without that glider and sometimes it doesn't even look like it's that significant like this one here that i'm showing you i just jumped off it looked like it'd be a nothing burger and then i died instantly upon hitting the ground so be careful with gravity respect it
Also, be sure to stay curious when you're exploring in this game. This game is all about exploring, finding hidden treasures, and they are tucked everywhere, behind doors and under piles of debris, underground, next to grave sites. They are everywhere, so stay curious and always be checking for treasures. You'll be surprised how often you find something. Quick shout out to Corsair, who has supported me and my channel on my journey. For the best computer peripherals out there, check out my link in the description. And that is everything, guys. These videos take a ton of time to make and to edit. So if you enjoyed it, I would really appreciate it if you gave a thumbs up and even leave a comment down below letting me know. It feels good to read those and it helps with the algorithm. So thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it. And massive shout out to my channel members. If you want to become a channel member, click the join button down below to get perks like behind the scenes footage, access to a private Discord channel and more. Sincerely, thank you guys so much for watching. Sub for more Enshrouded content and I'll see you guys in the next video. Video.